it's okay. Well, this is this is bulletproof, right? I can just step behind the screen. <laughs> Well, my friends, and uh, yet to be friend, we are glad that you've all come here, and we're just about ready to start. So some of you know that I've been doing this for a number of years, invite people that have expertise, and then they share uh, some of their knowledge, and it's kind of a cool thing. Tonight is quite special because our, our presenter tonight is here from the state of Wisconsin, no less, and he's quite an amazing person on a number of levels. Before I tell you a little bit more about him, I wanna begin by giving a little bit of a take on, on Wayne May as it relates to the subject matter. Some of you are aware that there are some significant controversies about where the Book of Mormon took place, the actual physical location of it. And there are actually mm, hundreds of sites that have been identified from Peru to Baja California to all over, but the two main sites that have sort of been identified by the most significant proponents are either Mesoamerica or the heartland of North America. Now, without going into all the details about the whys and wherefores of that, I just want to make a comment or two because I kind of have interesting feelings about this. There are some proponents of the Mesoamerican uh, model that pay no attention to Wayne May. And the reason they pay no attention to Wayne May or anything he's done is because he doesn't have those special letters after his name. Wayne May is a college graduate, but he doesn't have those special letters indicating he went to graduate school in archaeology. And so some people think he shouldn't be paid attention to because he doesn't belong to that inner circle. Uh, I do not feel that way at all. I might have some of those letters after my name, but who in the heck cares? As far as I'm concerned, what matters is what someone brings to the table in terms of what they've done and what they present. It's very interesting because probably at the end of this conversation, of this presentation, if Wayne does what he usually will do, he says, I report, you decide. So when you hear Wayne May's presentation tonight, you decide for yourselves to whatever extent you think this makes sense or not. Now, a little bit more about our speaker. Wayne May actually is a convert to the church. Shortly after the time that he graduated uh, from the university in Wisconsin, Madison, um, he joined the church. And that was an interesting story we heard about tonight. But the short story is this. After joining the church, he embraced the gospel, but he got interested in archaeology even as a kid. <coughs> But here's the thing that's interesting about Wayne May, in spite of the fact that he doesn't have some of those special letters after his name. Wayne May has written five books. He has produced 18 DVDs or CDs. And even prior to doing any of that, he started a publication, a professional publication on archaeology 28 years ago, in which he's been working with archaeologists mainly in North America, but all over. And so he's been publishing an archeological treatise on, uh, it's called Ancient American. But anyway, um, if those kind of experiences and productions don't give Wayne May some real credibility, <laughs> I don't know what does. At any rate, I've uh, known, Way for, known Wayne May for a few years and I've always found him to be very interesting, highly informative, and just presents stuff that's interesting, at least to me. I'm hoping that all of you will find that some of your, in, your understanding about this topic, which is the archeological and geographic evidence for the Book of Mormon, to be at least interesting and informative. 
So without further ado, we're going to now turn the time over to Wayne May. Well, I will say that uh, this is the smallest space I've had to stand in <laughs> in a very long time. Um, if I get excited, I might slap the screen, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, we'll make it work. So, and also, if any of you out there are, are Two Hill supporters and you get mad at me, please don't throw anything. You might hit the screen and hurt it, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to jump behind it anyway, so. All right. When I got baptized in 1970, I want to make sure this, you, and Trace touched upon this, it's very important to me. It had absolutely nothing to do with archaeology. Um, you know, sometimes you, get, you, you just get hit, you don't see something coming. And uh, this is the case for me and doing what I'm doing here right now. Um, yes, doing the archaeology magazine is one thing, because that's my main, that's my business. That's my, that's my Gentile work, all right, is Ancient American Magazine. And what I do here, uh, church-wise, this is just something extra, because I really enjoy it, and I believe in it, and I know a lot of people that live out here in the West, where the, the heart of the church resides, that you don't know what's back East, and I know this. And so when I first started coming out here, even till to this very day, I just ask everybody, you know, if you've been discouraged with what you see south of the Rio Grande, because I know a lot of people have been discouraged, and sometimes it's, it's allowed to affect their testimony, I, I've asked, look, and before you, you know, chuck it all, come take a look at what's out east, and just have a look and be fair and see what's here, because there's a whole lot more to the east than what uh, you realize. So with that, I want to get started. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to talk a lot about one particular group of people called Hopewell. Now, uh, it's just a name. Uh, it could have been your last name. When archaeologists go to a site and they perform a dig, the landowner, he usually gets uh, the fame of the site. So for example, uh, Hopewell, this guy's name was uh, Mordecai C. Hopewell. And this is where they first started to start in the 1890s under the Smithsonian and do everything the proper way that they could at that time. Because prior to this, there was all kinds of people doing all kinds of things, uh, some properly, some improperly. But they had nowhere to put all this material. So a lot of things that came up early after <clears throat> the Civil War got scattered to the wind in private collections. And some things were just tossed and destroyed. So in 1890s, finally the Smithsonian got together and said, okay, now, from this point forward, we dig up a site, and if we find things that identify this people between 500 B.C. to 400 A.D., which is the date they set, this, I didn't set this date, this is their date, they said, we're going to call it Hopewell, because we're going to start on this guy's farm, Mordecai Hopewell. Could you imagine that guy's name would have been Mordecai Nephi? <laughs> this would be the Nephi culture of North America. I mean, but you know, that's how, that's how silly it is. So don't let the name bother you, but that's the, this is the group that we're after. Now, uh, tonight, Trace, he gave me, uh, let's see here, whoops, make sure this is working right, there we go. Yeah, he gave me five questions that he asked me to address. And so that's what's going to guide and steer the, my presentation tonight, and I will have each question in front of each change when we get that far. So you can see attempts to minimize the knowledge of the indigenous civilizations, likely origins of the Maya civilization, evidence of the Nephite, Hopewell, and Jaredite, which is the Adena of North America, correlation of statements by Joseph, the scriptures, Book of Mormon geography, and a potential site of Zarahemla across from present-day Nauvoo. So, the Promised Land. Well, of course, when I joined the church, I saw a lot of people were looking at the whole hemisphere. Uh, South America stood by itself. Central America stood by itself. And then there's the Great Lakes model, uh, which was we will call limited. You'll see that just in a minute. The Heartland model hadn't started yet. And the reason it hadn't started is because I hadn't started it. <laughs> That's me. Okay? All right. So the mound builders, there's three general groups that we look at. If you go back or you pick up any book on Middle America, you're going to run into all three of these groupings. The late Archaic and the Adena, out of that group, we're going to have our Jaredites. Out of that Hopewell group, we're going to get all three, Nephites, Mulekites, and the Lamanites that were particularly identified at that time. And then there's a big four, 500 gap 
until the Mississippians show up. Now you're gonna see a lot of their stuff if you jump in your car and drive back across the southern part of this country because they built on top of the Hopewell sites and because they were last, their mounds and cities are more prevalent, okay? So it's like, you know, whoever gets their last is gonna be the one you're gonna see first. And uh, underneath them is the Hopewell, underneath them is the Adena, et cetera, et cetera. But there are Adena and Hopewell sites plenty to go look at today. Question, why is there a gap from 500 AD to 900 AD in the archaeological record. Why is there a gap? What happened in the Book of Mormon at Cumorah when the Nephites were finally destroyed at a, as a national civilization? What happened to those, the conquerors? What happened? They, among themselves. they fell into civil war. So approximately 400 AD, we had a dark age is taking place here in North America, just like a dark age is taking place in Europe. So again, just keep that in mind. Parallels, interesting. And I like to talk about parallels, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. I'll make a better demonstration, but here's your Book of Mormon, here's your hard dates, and then the archeologists of North America, non-LDS people, they have set these other dates that you see below. So you can see how well these things line up. I mean, this is really, really good. And the best part is that they're non-LDS. So they can't accuse us of salting the ground, so to speak, okay? They're doing our work for us. We just have to be able to look and see and realize what's going on. Now, when I joined the church, this is what I was taught. Lehi landed down here somewhere near this Darien Peninsula, which was fine. I, it was okay. I, it didn't matter. And then uh, the Book of Mormon took place between South and Central America. The narrow neck, of course, is sitting there at uh, Isthmus of Panama. And again, this was all agreeable. It didn't matter one way or the other. What did was kind of confusing is that there was no single hill picked for the two Camorra boys. They got four hills picked. So which one is it? You know, one Camorra, two Camorra, three Camorra, four, how many more? You know, but so that they just don't have a single hill picked out. And they still don't to this day, even though they pitched that it took place there somewhere in Mexico. And then, of course, here we are at 421 AD, Moroni says farewell. So this is the two-hill Camorra theory that's been really prevalent since the 1970s. And uh, for me, that's what I was taught when I first came to church. And as I said before, it was okay, it didn't matter, because uh, I didn't come in the church because of archaeology. So here's what's going on right now, this very moment. Right here in Mesoamerica, they have shrunk their area down to 1,000 square miles taken in part of Mexico and Yucatan, and this is what we call the Mesoamerica model. Supposedly, this is where it all took place for the Book of Mormon. Now, good man in the church who said, okay, we still believe that Palmyra is the Camorra, so we'll take the same 1,000 square mile area and we're gonna drop it on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And that's gonna become our Book of Mormon lands. The problem is once you do that, the earliest, the oldest culture sitting there is about 100 to 200 A.D. Hopewell. It's not old enough. And the Meso guys pick on the limited guys, and they're correct. It's not old enough. They don't have enough archaeology to support the entire book. So if you're going to look at Hopewell, you've got to take in the entire area. And that is the area, the heartland of America, Hopewell. All right? Okay. Here's our first question from Trace Tanner. Attempts to minimize the knowledge of indigenous civilizations by the Smithsonian, and I put in, and others. Okay, because it, it's both. Now, the Native Americans, they have been, in my estimation, so misused and misappreciated, misunderstood uh, as a group of people, and I, I really think that they have come to the fact to realize just that. And so what happens to minimize these guys because of the political nature of our country and manifest destiny expanding <clears throat> all the way to the sea, <clears throat> because the Native Americans are nomadic, uh, that's looked upon as, you know, as a Stone Age culture, their tribal groups are not trustworthy, idol worshipers, hunter-gatherers, small populations, <laughs> constant infighting, no written language, no use for metal other than trinkets, and of course they arrived here by the land bridge only. They came from the west. Now that's how they're looked upon, that's what we're taught to this day. 
So the question is, ask yourself, if you went to a learned person and you asked them, what is the first reason, assuming they understand the Book of Mormon, how it all came to be, what is the first reason you would turn away from the Book of Mormon as a historical document? Historical document, not spiritual, historical. What would be the first reason? Well, they're going to go back and slide. You may think, well, they're going to turn away because these plates came to Joseph from an angel that flies in their face. They can't handle that. Or they're going to say, well, maybe it's the first vision. No, that's spiritual. Can't use that one. But what they're going to say, the reason that they turn away from the Book of Mormon is because you people are all diffusionists. You're diffusionists by default. What that simply means is you believe people came here before Christopher Columbus. And how did they get here? Our academics tell us there was no maritime technology to bring them here. They could not sail the open seas. And yet, what does the Book of Mormon tell us? Jaredites came by boat. Lehi and his family came by boat. And the Mulekites came by boat. So right away, we are, in, we are at odds with the academic community, okay, right away. And yet, we, you, you are all diffusionists. You have your testimony. We know this, this work is of God. And then we, got, we have this right here, the West meets East deal. And I really like this because the Clovis people, who were the champions of coming from the West, that now, even in academia, has been brushed aside. They know people were here. They're admitting that people have been in, in, in Central and South America and even parts of North America way before 13,000 B.C. So the Clovis, if that's something you're stuck on, the Clovis thing is gone. And we can look at our Mulekites coming into the North, Lehi coming into the South. And I like that because of 610, again, think about that small 1,000 area, geographic area. The Lord brings Mulek into the land north. He brings Mule, uh, Lehi into the land south. And they will not see each other for how long? 400 years. If they were inside that 1,000 mile area, they would have bumped into each other way, way before Mosiah was commanded to take the Nephites from the land of Nephi and to go down to Zarahemla. But because of the distance, this would work out just fine. And that's what they did. <clears throat> and then, what I really like, we have Native Americans. The guy in here, he is a professor at the University of, uh, <clears throat> of, of um, Colorado. And his name is uh, DeLorean, Dan DeLorean. And he tells us he is well respected. He was involved with getting NAGPRA established for the museums. And so they, everybody loves uh, Mr. Deloria. And so they get him in there, Vine, and uh, they talk to Mr. Vine. He gives this great, great uh, delivery. And it's all recorded here on the Atlantic Monthly, so you can go look it up and read it for yourself. You notice it says the diffusionists have landed. That's you guys. They're talking about crossing the water. Okay, and this and Atlantic Monthly is a pretty substantial, well-read magazine. But uh, Vine, what he tells everybody, he says at the end, he says, okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for helping the Native Americans establish and get our, our graves uh, uh, protected where we can. But he said, uh, one of the guys then stands up and says, Vine, tell us where your people came from, how you got here. And Vine said, okay. He said, we, uh, we left a land in turmoil, a lot of trouble. We sailed across the Atlantic Ocean in boats. We came into the St. Lawrence Seaway, sailed into the Great Lakes of North America, and from there we spread out through the heartland of this country. Well, the minute he said that, he had about 200 archaeologists all just absolutely going crazy. I mean, they had never heard this before, and Vine was well respected. So finally, when the roar call calmed down, they asked Vine, says, Vine, why haven't you told us this before now? We've helped you do all these things. Why have you been silent on this important crossing from the east? And Vine simply said, you never asked. That's all he had to say. You see, we don't listen to the Indians because they are a Stone Age culture. They don't have anything to offer, and that's how we treat them. And this right here, I'm just going to show you this book here, Michigan Copper. In here, this is where I first came across it. Uh, this was uh, Fred Ridholm, a good friend of mine, and he's got a jib boy in here, and he's got a Sioux, it's a Sioux boy in here, and both these guys are telling the legends that they were taught as kids 
that they all came from the east, across the Atlantic Ocean, and ships coming from the east. Here is the map that the Ojibwa nation used to teach their children about how they got here. This is their map. This isn't in any history book in high school or college. This is their book, and this is called the Mishomas, the Voice of the Ojibwa by Edward Benet, uh, Benton Benet, excuse me, he's a holy man in the Ojibwa nation. And uh, you can find this book online. It's pretty neat. Because when you do, you'll also find out a really cool thing. Red Sky's migration chart, they talk about not only crossing the east, but they talk about coming over in eight turtle boats. Interesting. Eight turtle boats. Now, are the Ojibwe our Jaredites? No, I don't think so. But could they have run together? Yeah, it's very possible. And when you get two cultures strung together, eventually one of their histories will come out and dominate the stories that will be carried forth. And any anthropologist will back that up. So what I'm saying to you is that all the Jaredites did not die at 600 BC. They're here for 1,700 years. They would not have all stayed around Lake Ontario or Lake Erie all that time. There had to be colonies all across this country, even into Mexico, even into Alaska. Who knows where they all went? The point is, they were still here. And to find that out, you pick up a book called uh, Lehigh in the Desert by Professor Hugh Nibley. Turtle Boats, and there's the book. If you read this book, you will read all about the Jaredites who survived after 600 B.C. and mingled with the people in Zarahemla, which are the Mulekites. Okay? Turn it off. Sorry, it's my phone. <laughs> it's my wife making sure I'm working. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, you, Tana. Oh, yes. So the, the copper mines, when were they active? Do you know the years? Yeah, copper mines were, well, they were extremely active about 2400 B.C. all the way to 850 B.C., which is Jaredite timeline. Total, total, which is awesome. But there's also a group that did it about a, there's about a 800 to 1,000 year gap. There's a group before them that go way back. And because of this gospel that we have here, where, where did it all start? Started here, right? Okay. So the stuff who was there before, I feel, were Adam's people. They were mining copper before the flood. So yes, sir. In the uh, in ether, it talks about the Jaredites got there and then they became very, very prosperous. Yep. Would that be consistent with the copper mine? Oh, totally, totally. Uh, what you have up there is over 10,000 copper pits, and they dug hole to about 30 foot depth, and they throw up huge banks of earth. And that's what we see today. And there's enough copper waste in the banks of earth. We have guys in the UP, that's Upper Peninsula. It's called, we call them prospectors. And they go out into the woods, they find the pit, and they just kind of dig through the bank of earth that's been cast up. And they pull out enough copper to make a living, and uh, they don't work all winter. That's their lifestyle. Upper Peninsula. Good guys. Okay? So, when we met the Indians, our first uh, ancestors from Europe, what did they tell us? The first European settlers said that they were forts. We're talking about all the hill forts in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. The Indians said they were forts, forts inhabited by white or light complexion people. These people came from the east. These people made artifacts which are strange to them. These people lived in the old territory. The Indians said they did not build the forts. The Indians had a great war with the, these people. The Indians exterminated these people. They do not know who built all these burial mounds. Anciently, many waves of people have migrated to this land. What's really important today, when you look in the old books from Civil War up to about 1920, the archaeologists and historians who were writing these books, they clearly identify two cultures, a defender and an attacker. They tell you straight out. And for me, the Hopewell culture, they are the ones that are defenders, and that's my Nephites, and of course the hunter-gatherer people, the Lamites, they're doing the attacking. Today, you go talk to an archaeologist today, and they're trying to take both these groups and to squeeze them down into one group called the woodland culture, a single group. They are ignoring the work of the earlier historians that did the foundation work after the Civil War. And I don't know why they do that, but that's what they're doing. So when you go out on your own, you're going to find this type of thing. You're going to find it in two different directions. So just be aware that that's what's happening currently today. 
And so this uh, place of resort, this also is talked a lot about because of the high hill forts, which we'll see in a little while. Uh, the big hill forts, they didn't know what to think. They thought, well, there's so many of them, maybe they all have to be uh, sacred sites. They must all be t temples or churches. And, you know, that's why the whole idea of the Indians tell them, no, 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 they're forts, they're forts, they're forts. And today they're telling us these are all sacred sites. So the, the joke today out in the field, if a new fort is found, the archaeologists right away say, well, it's another sacred center. They just label it right away. When in fact the Indians will tell you these were forts, places of refuge. And I like this one here. He pictured it as a refuge for tribes living within a 50 mile radius who could flock this protective walls whenever the enemy threatened. And that's from Moorhead in, in 1890. And then right here, this is a Brother Talmage. This is Apostle Talmage. This information is in his diary, and that's in the church uh, historian's office. This is where this comes from. He said, the area now included within the political boundaries defining the state of Ohio was once inhabited by two distinct peoples, representing two cultures, a higher and a lower. These two cultural types or distinct peoples were generally in a state of hostility one toward the other, the lower culture being more commonly the aggressor and the higher the defender. From a careful culling of data, it is demonstrated that the general course of migration through the area now defined as the state of Ohio was inward from the west and outward toward the east. Where did the war begin in 322 in the Book of Mormon? It began in the west. It began in Zarahemla, the western edge. And that's exactly what he's talking about. It begins in Illinois and Iowa, going to the east, from the west to the east, all the way to get to 385 and 600 BC to 421 AD. Why can't we just take, accept this man's work? This is dirt archaeology at its best. This guy doesn't have thermal luminescence. He doesn't have GPR. He doesn't have gr drones overhead taking uh, infrared photography of the land. This is just absolute grunt work in the earth. And this guy has laid out the path, I believe, of the Nephites' final days moving toward Camorra land before they are perished. And this is in our church history. It's in there. Apostle Talmage. Now, again, to demonstrate this, this is pretty neat. And this happened, uh, I think it was 2017. This is uh, the bookstore that is no longer there, which is I'm really sad about. Uh, they closed it, the Latter-day Harvest, in uh, Palmyra, New York. Uh, Mark Burris was the uh, manager there, a good friend of mine. And he tells this story about this uh, certain war club. What happens is, he says, this guy comes in, he sees this artifact. I had eight cases that are on display, by the way, if people look at. He sees this artifact, and the guy's a Mohawk. He knows him. He's a CPA. He's a well-educated man. He works at one of the casinos. And uh, he looks at this thing, and he's all excited because of the alligator. And this was, this was all new information for me in just 217. The alligator is just really, really important. So here's basically the breakdown. This is the exchange, the Mohawk. Wow, an alligator totem. Mark Burris, what's the big deal about an alligator totem? Why not an eagle, a bear, or a turtle? Mohawk, when we landed and got off the boat, the first animal we saw was the alligator, and so it became sacred to us. Mark Burris, and I suppose you're going to tell me you landed somewhere down south? Mohawk, yeah, somewhere in the Gulf, but we do not remember the exact place. The alligator is still sacred to us today. Just think about that. Okay, I'm just going to take a peek here. Here's the club. There's a close-up. And here's one that's on the internet. I just punched in Mohawk alligator totems and it came right up. This was a war club. Okay, and there's an alligator, in case you've never seen one. <laughs> now, here's what's important. I go through the mounds of Ohio. I've been there for years. And there's one mound I have avoided because it made no sense to me. I stayed away. I didn't take any tour groups there. Never, except for a couple of private ones, small groups. But the big bus group I never took here because look what we got. A Hopewell alligator mound. And what do our archaeologists tell us? The Indians are wrong. The pioneers heard it from their ears wrong. It has to be some kind of a water spirit. There's no such thing as an alligator in the Hopewell people, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. 
They don't listen to our Native Americans. They're talking to us, and they're telling us, this is an alligator mound. That's the altar made out of natural stones, which you'll find out how important that is, and that's where it is today. It's very hard to delineate, but uh, for me, this is an alligator mound, and it goes well with the Mohawk story, okay? And Dr. Lepper, he's the head archaeologist for Ohio, and uh, he's the one leading the charge that uh, this is not an alligator. It has to be something else, but not an alligator, okay? And this is sad. So the alligator surprise, the Mohawk native reveals the alligator is sacred due to their first landing in the southern U.S. It's oral history. It's not written down anywhere. Native American artifact of Chief Scepter allowing showing alligator, which is a private collection that I purchased from, and the Hopewell effigy mound identified by Native America as an alligator, but recorded unknown animal by historians and archaeologists. Really sad. Really sad. March issue of my Ancient American magazine. We have in Ohio <coughs> alone uh, 30 smelters. Uh, this one here comes out of uh, uh, Virginia. And uh, it's, we, we did everything right. They came in, they took the samples, they got the date from the lab at 150 AD. This is Book of Mormon timeline. Uh, these guys were smelting copper and iron. And we know that for a fact, and I'll, this will come up again later. And I tell you, our academics have totally ignored this. They say, well, it has to be Viking, or if not Viking, then maybe it's French, French and British during the war time. And these are all theirs, but the point is, we got the dates. It's 150 AD, so there's no argument. This is Book of Mormon timeline. Yes, sir? I've got a something of this right on top of one of those copper mines in the UP. Okay. And I heard a story, and, and you can probably validate it, that they had tested uh, you know, the uh, atomic uh, uh, fingerprint mm -hmm. and found it somewhere in England or Europe that validated that that copper came from Michigan and it is pre- Cornwall, Cornwall, England. That's where it came. That's where they found it. They found an, uh, a copper arrowhead, and uh, when they looked at it, they found it was copper from Upper Michigan, in England. So yeah. And they dated that as what? Uh, around about 3,000 BC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it goes on. It's unbelievable. And and this one here, I really love the Temple Lot, Independence, Missouri. Uh, I had the unique experience about a year ago of having in my home one of the chiefs of the Potawatomi Indians, Chief Shupshi, and in talking to him about this place, the temple lot, he revealed to me the fact that many centuries ago from various tribes of the Indian people met together in this area. They had great battles. They came together in their war paint, and he said they were met by a personage from heaven who told them they must cease war. He commanded that they should go back to their various tribes, bring a stone, and put it in a heap, marking the place where in the future days the great lodge of the lord or great spirit as he called him would be built he said that after that they did and they went forth in peace this is the temple lot in missouri and if you read the early accounts when joseph got there there was a pile of stone and the indians were bringing stones there and dropping them off every year matter of fact as much as four to five years after the temple lot I should say after independence was getting well established because the locals were taking the stones from the pile and using them for fences, foundations for their homes, fireplaces. And the Indians came back, several of them, and they were looking for their stones. They walked the streets of independence and they recognized their stone in <laughs> someone's chimney. <laughs> they want their stone back. So, I mean, a sad story, but this is on our temple lot. That's my point. And, you know, this is nothing new. This is, this is old information. It, it, it's not hidden. You can find it. And this one here is one of my favorites, too. The Algonquins have their own language, the Mi'kmaq in particular. The Mi'kmaq language was taken by John Eliot. He invested 12 years, and he wrote and published the first Bible in North America. Not in English, not in Latin, Algonquin. The very first Bible, 1663. You can see these at the Peabody Museum or at the Smithsonian. That's the only two copies that I know that exist, the original, the very first edition. And then I know this one here. Whoops, come back, there. We have temple language being used by many of our Native American tribes. Can everybody see the key words? Can you see them? Do I have to say them? 
to pray is Pele. God is ale. The ring a bell? Yes. And we're told in the temple these were Adamic words. What are Adamic words doing in North America? Hmm? It must have came over with the Jaredites. That'd be my guess. Ten tribes of Israel. And then I love this one too. South Shore of Lake Superior. This guy would be a French trapper. He's met this Indian chief years ago. And when they first met, there is a standard greeting, even to this day, that is used by the tribes all around the Great Lakes. Doesn't matter which one you go to, but they raise their right arm to the square and they say, Ao. That means I come in peace, I bear no arms. And that way they can exchange, they go about their business, and they don't bother each other. But when he did that, this chief and them visited, and the chief decided that this guy was okay. And he said, if you come back here in the future, and I'm not here, and my second who's behind me, if he's here, he said, all you got to do is make this sign. You all recognize the other sign? Yes? Okay. And if you, if you do this sign, that will tell my second, in, my second in command that you've already been introduced to the tribe and you can stay here and enjoy the safety and protection of our village. But you have to make this sign. Rather interesting. And I love this here, glottochronology. Glottochronology is the attempt to estimate how long ago two languages separated from a common ancestor by evaluating their degree of divergence on a list of key words. Linguists applied this technique to the Algonquin dictionaries compiled by early colonists. The results indicated that the various Algonquin languages in New England all date back to a common ancestor that appeared in the Northeast a few centuries before Christ. I think that's pretty important. This ancestral language may derive from what is known as the Hopewell culture. Thank you, Charlie Mann. I love this guy. Now here's a guy, Brian Stubbs, Blanding, Utah. He is an epigrapher. This is what he does. The strength of language evidence is that if enough of it has been preserved to be demonstrated linguistically, then language is among the strongest kinds of evidence. Language families cannot be fabricated. Written records unearthed in the Americas are often labeled hoaxes. But language ties, when apparent, show specific ties from ancient to modern times, and the thousands of speakers of the related languages are beyond fabrication. Let's take a look, see if we can find anything. First of all, we got an obvious match here, right? Book of Mormon, Old Testament, all these words, these names end in a, uh, right? A H. Here are some names of Native American chiefs that live in the Midwest. This is exactly what Dr. Stubbs is talking about. You cannot make this up. This doesn't happen by chance. This has come down over centuries of time. Language. And this is in North America. Yes. Yes, sir. With all of those words and names in the in ah sound, it seems like so many American Native names, Chattanooga, Kiowa, Chippewa, Catawba. Wak Wakanda, Wakantanka. Uh -huh. They all, it's just... Winnie Waka. Mm -hmm. It's all Wisconsin. Come to Wisconsin, see, all you Spanish speakers, you'll have a hard time. But I can help you, because I can say their names. I, I, sh I wish I had the spelling here of, of uh, the forest. Shaquamagon. If you saw that, I know you wouldn't get through it. Shaquamagon. So, yeah, okay. And now this, this is pretty cool. Ripley Ancom, waters that exceed all. Look what we found in the dictionary from the Algonquins. Rivers, look at the word for rivers. Starts with the rip. Lake, the same. So here we have a water connection. You know, big water, river, lake, all begin at the rip. And then I dropped in Ripla for, you know, Book of Mormon, Tai, Hill, Camorra, and Riplakish, Jurdai King. Big, great, waters of, you know, Ripley Ancom, big, great again. So there they are. Again, another little... You know, little tidbit. Should be great. And this one's pretty good. You all have seen the Manton transcript probably a hundred times. Dr. Barry Fell got a hold of this because he was checking out the Micmac or the Micmog of 
Maine, New England, New Hampshire, New, Newfoundland. And what he found was that they had a book called the Book of Prayers. And they were writing this down, and the kids were playing with, with games, and they're using birch bark, making little signs and hiding them in the forest, and that was part of their game running around. And so him and the early black robes, they took the Catholic catechism, and they made this book to teach them about Jesus Christ. And it's called the Book of Prayers. It, it still exists today. It's not gone anywhere. And the Algonquin can read this. Look at the matches to the Algonquin paper. What do you see? What do you think? It's pretty neat, huh? Again, this is what Stubbs is talking about. You can't make this stuff up. And Dr. Barry Fell, he goes on and says, it is evident that the Micmac hieroglyphs must already have been transmitted to North America more than 2,000 years ago when they were still in use in Egypt. Boy, is that a ringer. It's all Book of Mormon. All parallels, guys. It's all supportive. All supportive. And this one here, this, this one is a real surprise. <laughs> a gal by the name of Henrietta Mertz, who I publish her work, I, I got her book from her family. It's in public domain, and I, I bought it from the family to keep it in print. Um, <clears throat> she was a code breaker in World War II. Lawyer by trade, sharp as a tack. Good gal. She was, had some kind of a book in her hand. I don't know what it was. Or it might have been something from the Smithsonian. And when she opened it up, as you see that stone, this is the Bat Creek stone, by the way. She's looking at it, and she mm, can't get through it. She doesn't understand it. And somehow, I guess she either dropped her book, or for some reason, she turned it upside down. And this is, this is now the upside down that she's looking at is really the right side up. And she said, I can read this. This is Paleo-Hebrew. And it says for Judah, and then the one end to the left is broken off, so you can't get the whole thing. So she brings in the top-notch epigrapher in the United States of America at this time was Dr. Cyrus Gordon. So Gordon goes to Smithsonian, they pull it off the display, and they let him examine it. And he says, yeah, this is Paleo-Hebrew. And it says for Judah. And so the Smithsonian said, okay, that's great. And they take the stone, they take it back out to the public display, and they put it the way it was, wrong side up, and say Cherokee alphabet. Totally ignoring Dr. Gordon. And Gordon is well respected in the circles in Europe, anywhere. He, this guy's really top notch. Now, this happened a long time ago. I was just messing around about two years ago, and I, I just kind of bumped into this here. Now, this is a shekel from the Jewish war. This is from Israel, it's not from North America. There's the date, 68, 72 BC, or excuse me, AD. And I did a reverse on the Bat Creek Stone so you could see the letters better. I was looking at over at the coin and I thought I could see some similarities. So I'm gonna do a reverse on the coin. That's for Judah. I'm looking at the coin and I'm saying, wow, look at that. Holy mackerel. How about that one? How about that one? That one? What do you think? Are they the same? They sure look the same to me. So I went and applied for an epigraphy degree online, and I'm waiting for it to show up. <laughs> uh, this is not hard, okay? And I'm gonna tell you the sad, the sad part, and I'm not gonna tell you his name, but a fellow from Ancient Scripture, Department of BYU, he told me straight out to my face, he says, Wayne, you gotta quit showing the Bat Creek Stone. And I said, why? He said, because uh, the letters are incorrectly done. Uh, they're not laid out in the proper form. And he said, it's just bogus. And you're, you're messing up the members of the church. That's what's sad. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. And he's teaching our kids. Bat Creek Stone, excuse me. This is the Decalogue Stone, Ten Commandments. <clears throat> this uh, was given as a discourse by Elder Orson uh, Pratt. Actually, in the uh, <clears throat> tabernacle, as you can see the dates there. And there's your uh, number if you want to read about the whole thing, Journal of Discourses. But uh, Orson, he, uh, he really liked this. <laughs> he said, the builders of these mounds south of the Great Lakes in the great Mississippi Valley in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, New York, must have understood the Hebrew characters and also understood the law of Moses. Now look real good at that centerpiece. That's a stone. Ten commandments are on it in the front, the sides, and the back. And it was inside that little black case you see there, underneath the largest mound in North America, which was taken down for to make a dam 
in Buckeye Lake, Ohio. So I happened to be in Rome. My daughter was over there with her husband who was a military doctor. And so we jumped over there and we started hopping around real quick there to see things before they came back home. And I'm walking through a museum in Rome and I walk into the room and I see these things here and I thought, oh my goodness, this is so cool. I'm looking at this piece and I'm looking at this piece. Now I'm gonna show you a close up. There it is, there it is. Now here comes the Ohio Decalogue. What do you think, we got parallels? Boy, I sure think so. Made my day. That was rocking. <laughs> Cyrus Thomas. He became second in command to uh, John Wesley Powell. Um, guy was not too bright. Every time they found an artifact, because they excavated probably about uh, 4,000 mounds in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and every time they found an artifact that was not stone culture, stone age, he christened it as European manufacture. And they either kept them out, and we don't know where they are, or they reburied them in the same mound. And they said it has to be intrusive burial, which is be something on the surface, but they found out these things were deep inside the mounds with the actual skeletal remains. So to be that deep, there's no way they're intrusive burials. These were the artifacts of the Hopewell people, and they have been totally ignored. And he just wrote a little pamphlet, Problem with the Ohio Mounds, because they just, they just couldn't figure it out. Nobody here before Christopher Columbus, period. And that's what they fully believed. So here is, again, this is the Ohio Territory, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Kentucky. All those red dots are mound sites. And what you're looking at here is about 10% of what was here on first contact in 1492. So in 500 years, we've just about decimated the mound builder culture through farming, mainly urban sprawl. No one's fault. And I want you to notice the stars, the blue star, um, that's in where Tennessee is, down here at the bottom. That's the uh, oldest Hopewell temple built in Tennessee, and that's a story in that all by itself. I've got Kirtland marked up there by the uh, Lake, uh, Lake Erie, and Lake, uh, Lake Ontario, you've got Kilcamora, and then I've got Zarahemla marked by Nauvoo over to Iowa and Illinois, and then I got uh, the other one, this up here is Independence, okay, so you can kind of see where things are, and the one up way up in Wisconsin, anybody want to bet that is? Anybody guess? That's where I live. <laughs> That's me. Okay, the geometric earthworks. There are basically three types. The one on your uh, right is the small type, that's the most common. The one to your left is a hill fort. Uh, those are pretty thin. And then the geometric earthwork speaks for itself. There are more of those in the hill forts, but again, there's not a lot of them. But uh, you look at that, you say, my goodness, who, who could do that? And just so you can show, the Hopewell could go anywhere they wanted and they would build a geometric earthwork and they always built them at 40 acres, 10 acres, and 27.3 acres in size. So they had, they had some kind of a rule. They understood geometry, they understood surveying. This is not a Stone Age culture. And each one of these would be aligned up with the solstices and the equinoxes when they built them. Watching the sun, but in particular, they're watching the moon. They're on a 13 month lunar cycle, Hopewell. Who else has a 13-month lunar cycle? Ancient Israel. Another parallel, imagine that. Now let's show you for size. This is scale, I'm gonna show you. This is called sipe, or it's also called seep, depending on who you talk to, it makes no difference. But all that's there today is that big mound right smack in the middle, and then right straight above that are the two of the berms up there in red. They're, they're still left. Now what Ohio has done, which is a good thing, they have allowed the natural grasses to grow around the whole site, and then they mow because they can see it from the air with infrared photography, and they can lay out the entire earthwork. So they mow where the red lines are. So when you go up on top of the big mound, you can see the entire earthwork as it was meant to be seen, laid out through where the grass has been cut. It's really cool. I mean, they did a good job. Now, I'm gonna take these other things and drop them inside and let you see how big this thing really is. That's the Pyramid of Giza. 
We know how big that is, all right? Stonehenge, Roman Colosseum. Anybody been to see Rome, seen the Colosseum? So you know how big it is. I mean, this is nothing to laugh at. And just for kicks, we'll throw in Statue of Liberty. That all that fits inside of one, one geometric earthquake in Ohio. And here's Liberty. I'm going to show you the, uh, the berms, how big they are. Uh, right there, that red arrow on the bottom there, you can see that one length berm. I'm going to show that to you up close. It's a drawing, 50 foot wide, 12 foot high, two thirds of a mile, all four sides. These things are big. And they tell you it's small population. There's no way these were done by just a few people, especially if they're hunter gatherers. They'd be too busy out gathering their food to do this kind of work. This is specialized labor. Some to build, some to hunt, some to do whatever. And this is one of my favorites, Newark. You can see the wall here on the outside. This is called known as the Great Octagon and the Great Circle. Great Circle is at that one end that's touching. And this is all inside the city now. And if you do as a crow flies from one blue point to the other blue point, you've got a two mile distance to make up. Four miles around the walls to enclose the city. Okay, now all you math buffs out here, how many of you guys are sharp in math? Come on, don't be bashful. Let me see, who's good in math? Come on, somebody's gotta be good in math here. Must have some tax guys here, accountants, whatever. Okay, my friend Dr. Shares was one of the first guys to really go after the geometric earthworks for archaeoastronomy. It's really a new science, brand new. Started in the 70s. <coughs> he laid out north at the base of the hill, um, excuse me, the circle, which you see right here, okay? And then that line that runs all the way through the octagon, that happens, it lines up with the moon every 18.6 years. The moon will rise and shine right down that whole length. And this is the observation mound, and it shines all the way through every 18.6 years. This is our calendar, okay? Now, if you look at the angle here, 51.8 degrees, and then you go to the Pyramid of Giza over there. The angle on the bottom of the Pyramid of Giza is 51.8 degrees. And then squaring the octagon, the squares inside are 606 feet. All the way to the top on one side of the Pyramid of Giza is 606 feet to the top. 606 feet, if you take that times 10, you'll get 6,060 feet, and that's one nautical mile on the surface of the Earth. And this is how the Egyptians knew that the Earth was round. Stone Age culture, I give you our Native Americans. Sad what we've done to these guys. Now, on moonrise, this is what you'll see. Shining right down that whole thing. Today, this has been preserved, thank goodness, because it's a golf course. <laughs> so you can only go there early in the morning, otherwise you're gonna get a wrap on the head with a ball, okay? All right? Now, in spite of all this unfortunate lack of support for our Native Americans and for the Hopewell culture, we have a couple of archaeologists that are starting to wake up. And they're out of, of all places, Arizona. Most excavations of Ohio Hopewell ceremonial sites occurred from 1840 through the 1920s. And here's the key word, unpublished information. On-site layouts, features, artifacts, skeletal series. From these investigations and some later ones have discouraged the analysis and cultural interpretation of the material legacy of Ohio Hopewell people. In one single mound, identified as Mound 25, Warren K. Moorhead, uncovered 69 copper and iron head plates. And he also uncovered 92 copper and iron breastplates. Now, Here's another slap in the face. You can start in Missouri and go to New York and see every museum that you can find. Start in Wisconsin and then go north to south to Louisiana and see every museum you can find. You will see copper head plates. You will see copper breastplates. You will never see an iron artifact. Never. Iron. You'll not see one iron artifact that this guy's talking about. They're not on display. They have been deliberately held back because smelting shows civilization. Can't do it. It's still a cover-up. It's terrible. 
Terrible. Okay. Question two. All right. Likely origins. Oh, trace. Because I heard, uh, I saw a video from, uh, this was uh, uh, an anthropologist, I think, from Harvard University. And uh, she's either retired or close to retiring. And, she, and her statement was that the Smithsonian people had systematically and purposely destroyed numerous, numerous artifacts from those civilizations throughout North America. I mean, she thought it was a, it was a great tragedy that the Smithsonian people, supposedly scientists, had purposely destroyed it because it, 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 it went against, you know, the, the paradigm. Paradigm of, uh, you know, manifest destiny. So it gave the the whites the the excuse for wiping out Indians and relocating them because after all they were savages. But this was a Harvard professor that was lamenting the fact that one of the premier organizations in the world at that time had purposely done that and she thought it was a crying shame so just very true very true if i went on you know, i could show you a presentation on all the stuff that's been destroyed um you, you probably wouldn't believe me <laughs> it's been that it's that bad i'm telling you it's really really that bad can you tell them about the two curators and who their fathers were and how they tied yeah. in Oh, I, that, that's a half-hour talk. Okay. Yeah. You guys will be here till 1 a.m. The price does will take two hours. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me get on with this. Likely origins of the Mayan civilization based on an architecture and religious iconography. This guy right here is retired currently, but he is the leader on Mayan archaeology in North America and Central and South America. And uh, his name is Michael Cole. You can find him online, get home, punch on the computer, and he'll, you'll read all his stuff. And he makes fun of the Book of Mormon and the archaeologists of the church because everything that they're saying, according to him, is absolute baloney. The buildings in Palenque were constructed in the Ottolum times, beginning about A.D. 600. The earliest dated buildings in Palenque are over two centuries after the final destruction recounted in the Book of Mormon. Michael D. Cole, professor of anthropology at Yale University, commented on the difficulty of dating the ruins of Palenque to the Book of Mormon time period. How was one to reconcile this dating, Nephites, 600 B.C., A.D. 385, with the flat statement of Joseph Smith himself that Palenque was a Nephite city? This Maya center was built after 600 A.D., according to all modern scholarship, some 215 years after the Nephites had been wiped from the surface of the earth. I can only sympathize with the Mormon scholar who has to work that one out. Now, let's not worry about the dating. Let's go back to Joseph making the statement about Palenque. That never happened. That is untrue. But it looks true because his name was always on the Times and Seas papers because he was the editor. However, where his name was automatically stamped on the printing press, he then would sign it to accept it. The paper that talks about Palenque was done by William Smith, his brother, who they did not get along, and Joseph was in hiding at this time from those who wanted to arrest him. Joseph never read this before it went to print. And that is the gospel truth. Dr. Sorensen, Ensign, two parts, September and October of 84, he identified the Maya and the Nephite compared as the same people. Uh, this really stuck in my craw. Who are the Maya? Now this starts in 1849, 1849. <clears throat> United States, Central America, Ephraim, George Squire wrote, a proper examination of these monuments would disclose the fact that in their interior as well as their exterior form an obvious purpose, these buildings, temples in Palenque, Mexico, correspond with great exactness to those of Hindustan, India. The eminent scholar Miles Poindexter, a former ambassador of the United States to Mexico, in his two-volume 1930 treatise, the area Incas called the Maya civilization unquestionably Hindu. There are so many cultural similarities between the Hindu and the Maya civilization that it makes it very easy to point towards a common relation. Hindu America. I have republished this book. I've got it back there on my table. 
Maya temples and idols were lavishly decorated with gold and precious stones, just like those in India, and their divine images were painted in blue. The Maya of Yucatan offered animal sacrifices to the gods in the same way as done in North India at the same seasons and determined by the same stars, Hindu America. Okay? And this right here, we had missionaries. We had missionaries in America preaching Buddha. And this guy is well known. He's a real man. His name is Gautama. We know that for a fact. Guatemala means land of Buddha. Gautama is Buddha. And today you can find these guys in there still practicing that. We found this coin of Buddha and the temples in upper Michigan in the copper country. These guys were here and they came here in big waves and walked across this country. So Hindus in Central America, let's take a look at the architecture. Mesoamerica, Egypt, Indonesia, India. Pyramids construction, layers upon layers, all the same. Each one of these buildings at, at the base of it would have a small building facing the cardinal directions and it would be three doors on each side all the way around. And that's exactly what these guys do, the same thing. These guys must have gone to the same engineering school, that's all I got to say. Here is the big serpent that we talked about of Mesoamerica coming down the staircase. They got one just like it in the island of Bali. And here it is. Island of Bali, Mesoamerica. This is one of my favorites. Anchor Wat, Tikal, Guatemala. Pretty close? What do you think? Chichen Itza, Siem Reap, Cambodia. We now know, because of Anchor Wat, these guys had two and three masted sailing ships, and they were crossing the seas as early as three and 400 BC. They were all over North America. They brought Buddhism to this country, and we know this because they also visited Native Americans in Wisconsin, and it's only because I know these Indians that I found this out. Remember when the Red Book scare happened? Was it 70s with Mao, the Red Book? and the youth started killing professors and, and educated people, and it, just, it was a terrible time. Well, then they turned and went after Tibet. The Dalai Lama had to flee. And this is the big mystery. Nobody knows where he went. But I do. He came to Wisconsin. And he camped out in Black River Falls with the Ho-Chunk people because his missionaries had been there before, teaching Buddha. Look at the earrings. Look at the forehead. Look at the nose. Are these four guys, five guys, not the same? Skull structure and the earrings are the same. The one on the right is Angkor Wat, and the one on the left is uh, Maya country. Okay. And then we have some reverse diffusion. We're all, we've all been taught that corn went from here to the eastern hemisphere. Well, that's a big argument right now amongst anthropologists. It looks like corn may have come here by boat with Hindus. That's the take. Corn, Maya country, corn, Hindu. And check this out. Java on the left, Assyria and Ecuador on the right. These guys are in all tents and purses. Purposes practically exact. Showing sailing the seas. Corbeline, Angkor Wat, Maya, Pyramid of Giza. They all use corbeline to make their arches. A corbelled arch. Now, when Lehi and Mulek come over here, they're looking at the true arch all over their land. They're not looking at corbeling. Corbeling came first, and then the true arch would follow. But over here, they're still doing the corbelled arch. So the question is, when this happens, in masonry construction, a true arch is formed with a continuous line of wedge-shaped stones, while a corbel arch is formed by a series of overlapping stones. Compared with a true arch, a corbel arch is less stable and less efficient at converting tensile force into comprehensive force. So the question needs to be asked, why would Lehi and Mulek, wherever they came, why would they go backwards in construction and use a corbel arch when they have knowledge of the true arch? To me, it seems wrong. And <clears throat> here's two I've got on the Hindus on the back if you're interested. So, Hopewell temples, Nephite temples. What do we know about our temples? Well, Mosiah 2 and 7, it tells us that the Hopewell temples had walls around them. 
Uh, so people could not go in unless they were invited, I assume. And this is a typical one here in Hopewell Temple. Uh, the black is a ditch. Uh, the white part, that's the berm. They put a wall around and that would have a wooden fence then stacked all the way around it. They built uh, earthen platforms, uh, five, sometimes ten feet high. And then the, <clears throat> they had ramps going up to them. And notice the, the jagged line, that's the old shoreline. We now know that the rivers and lakes of North America were much deeper during the Book of Mormon timeline because the shipping, the, it talks about shipping, they had to be able to sail. They couldn't sail that well in the waters today, but then they were running all over. So I'm gonna put the water back in. That's what it would have looked like in their day. As much as 20 feet difference in depth. That's how, how big it is. So they could get around a lot easier on, th on uh, ships. Here's a Marietta, Ohio. Uh, the upper left, that's a drawing of the mound the temple mound that that library is now sitting on top of. That's what happens. We squat on top for stuff. Now, what's very interesting, I'm in uh, Israel, 2009 with Bruce Porter, and we're on a turn with the LDS Travel. And we're at Megiddo. Rabbi Wallenstein is uh, also with us. Uh, I don't know if you, anybody, if you've not been on an Israelite tour, uh, they have to, you have to have an, uh, an approved tour guide from Israel with you wherever you go. That's just standard procedure. So Rabbi Wallenstein, he's talking, we let him talk first, and then Bruce or I would, would fill in back to make the connection to our, our, our attendees. So anyway, he's looking at Megiddo, which is that upper left-hand corner, and he says, uh, you know, right here, this is, uh, you see big giant cutouts, like giant stairs, and each one had different architectural stuff, and he was pointing things out. And he said, here's a Canaanite altar, and here's a Israelite altar. Well, one of the gals raised her hand and said, whoa, Rabbi, I, I can't tell the difference. They look the same. Well, they were both using natural stone. But the difference is the Canaanites, they were using a staircase to go up to the top of the altar. All right? And you can see the steps here. And he said, well, what's the big deal about a staircase or a non-staircase? He said, well, it's against the law of Moses. Because if you walk up there, you can see their nakedness. And God said, no, you can't do that. It's against the law of Moses. Well, I looked over at Bruce. And I rolled my eyes, I, this, this guy's whacked, you know. This is crazy. And Bruce said, no, 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 take it easy, take it easy. So that night, we're in the Hotel Tiberius on the Sea of Galilee, and we're going through the five books of Moses. And uh, Bruce found it, and this is what he found. <coughs> Exodus 20, 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. <coughs> the rabbi was correct. But that's not what went in my head first thing I thought about was, boy, am I glad I'm not a Mesoamerica guy. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, every one of these buildings is in violation of the law of Moses. And you know, you've seen these things over and over again in books, in our own magazines, church newspapers, that these are Nephite structures. I'm here to tell you this is incorrect. These are not Israelite structures. Okay? And they are invited. They would never built this. They kept the law of Moses the best they could all the time. So we look at what, what, did the, what did the Hopewell do? They built ramps, ramps, and they'd extend them out so it'd be a long, gradual climb to the top, and that was acceptable to the Lord. All ramps, and these are actual Hopewell temple plots. Okay. So, second part: If thou make me an altar of stone. Thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. I've talked to many, many, many anthropologists and archaeologists south of the Rio Grande, and they tell me there's not one natural stone altar ever in any of the places they've been. They're all carved. Beautifully done, great archaeology, but it's not Book of Mormon archaeology. That's my point. Okay? So then I went looking. Jeepers, what do we got in Hopewell country? I find here a Hebrew altar, Temple of Arad in the Negev Desert of Israel. And I thought, well, if you built it an altar of natural stones, it's okay. I, didn't, I couldn't find anything on the surface for Hopewell. And then as I read deeper and deeper in the mounds, okay, what, what was down at the bottom? Uh, some places they, they found a lot of natural stones that had been strewn around, could have been built up for an altar, but again, they were already knocked over, so I really couldn't use that. And then finally, I got my first one. Hopewell, natural altar made out of stone. Is this a parallel? What do you think, brothers and sisters? What do you think? 
Isn't that awesome? It's incredible. Incredible. Yes. How big is that? Oh, I'd have to check it out. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not very big. I, I'd say at best probably four feet by four feet on the top. Yeah, maybe uh, waist high or even chest high, approximately. But it's it's a dead ringer, you know. Oh yes. Is there anything in Hindu culture that remotely corresponds with the Lehigh Stone in southern Mexico? I am not aware of any, but I'm I'm not a student of the Hindus either. Okay, and I just this is again just a recap, all right? Number three, you guys need to stand up and wiggle. Or are you okay? Go on. Want to keep going? You good? All right. Question three. Correlation of statements by Joseph Smith on scriptures with the Book of Mormon geography. And all I can tell you is I am totally satisfied Joseph knew exactly what was going on. There was never any doubt in my mind. Um, he, ha he has been so, <laughs> he's been treated poorly by a lot of people within the church. And it's really uh, shameful. But again, uh, after 18 years of gospel teaching and personal study, um, here's what did it for me. And I told that story today to Trace. In 1989, I'd been in the church now for 19 years, 18 years, and uh, our temple trip was 1,400 miles away to Salt Lake. But we got books, and I'm reading the book on the way back, and when I opened up the book on Joseph Smith's writings, and I read this here, we arrived this morning in the banks of the Mississippi. We left the eastern part of the state of Ohio, wandering over the plains of the Nephites, recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, roving over the mounds of that once beloved people of the Lord, picking up their skulls and bones as proof of its divine authenticity, signed Joseph Smith. This, uh, this for me was an aha moment. All my archaeology now clashed right into the Book of Mormon. And I, I just thought, this is unbelievable. What are we doing in Central America? And this is really my start. This is my jump start. This is what did it. This is what pushed me over the edge. To know that this heartland area is covered with the uh, Hopewell Nation. And then you read something like this, DNC 32, History of the Church, Volume 1, 118 to 120. Joseph Smith and sends Oliver Cowdery, Parley Pratt, Zeba Peterson, Peter Whitmer Jr. to preach the gospel to the Lamanites residing in the West. Now, West means the Western Territory, which was Ohio, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, revealing to them the sacred book, which is the history of their forefathers. Well, who's there? It's our Algonquins. It's the guys that are telling us they came from the East by boat. These are the guys that were the first mission. New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And notice the Shawnee. What's on his head? Nice big turban. Shawnee, Chickasha, Chickasha, Cherokee, Seminole. Oh, I've got a couple others. Um, the Catawbas. Um, I can't remember another one. Anyway, they all wore turbans. They didn't wear feathers in their hair. They wore turbans. And they lived in log cabins. If you read carefully about the uh, settlers, the first pilgrims coming onto the land over on the East Coast, the homes they built were taught, the Indians taught them how to build log cabins. Uh, they did it because they were living in log cabins and they also wore long britches. Uh, it was not new to them. And you know what, we just, what, we would not send missionaries south of the Rio Grande for about 75 years. So the question to ask yourself, did Joseph Smith get this wrong? Did he send our first missionaries out in the wrong place? I don't think so. There we go. Okay, and then we got letter seven. Joseph uh, asked Oliver, gives him eight topics. I want you to write a letter on all eight of these topics because they're important to the church and I want to leave them behind for legacy. And in letter seven, what Oliver writes with Joseph's complete approval, he shows that between the two hills, the fact that here between these hills, the entire power and national strength of both the Jarites and the Nephites were destroyed. And he's talking about Palmyra, Camorra. It's very, very clear. There's no question that these guys knew that Palmyra was the location. To Seton, 1833, he is, I wrote you for publication by the commandment of God. He sent in a whole letter to be published but they only published a little teeny blurb of it. And now he writes this letter to complain, why didn't you publish my letter I sent you because I was commanded by God to write this information. Now here's a portion of what did not get printed in the paper. 
The Book of Mormon is a record of the forefathers or Western tribes of Indians. By it, we learn that Western tribes of Indians are descendants from that Joseph who was sold into Egypt, and that the land of America is a promised land unto them. Can it get any plainer? Do you guys remember a few years back when we were studying the prophets and we had the book for the priesthood year on Joseph Smith? Remember all that, right? Do you realize the stuff I'm showing you now, this, this, these letters were in there for our Sunday lessons, but this was edited out. This was edited out. It wasn't there. But I knew what was happening, so I went to my branch president and I said, hey, look, I was high priest group leader at the time, and I said, I want to teach the quorum, a combined lesson. And he says, okay, and then I pulled out my book and I, I marked this lesson. I said, when you get here, this one's mine. Because when we got there, I gave them the whole deal. They got everything, all right? Not just the stuff that was in the lesson manual. You know, it's just not complete. And then we got Joseph identifying Manti in northern Missouri up by Huntsville. And we got two or three recordings out and the other uh, journals from the men who were with him. But what's interesting, south of Huntsville, is the largest freshwater spring in all of North America. 279 million gallons of water every day blow forth up out of the earth. Is this not a fountain of pure water? I think so. And what's neat about it is that the land of Mormon, the woods of Mormon, the, the fountain of Mormon lies in a southward direction out of Manti in the Book of Mormon. And if Manti is by Huntsville, this fills that, and I can't tell you that's the right place, I'm just saying this is a real good pick for Waters of Mormon. That's Huntsville, Missouri. It's, it's in Van Buren, Missouri. That is correct, Van Buren, Missouri. Whoops, there we go. And that's what it looks like. Beautiful, clear water blowing up out of the earth. It's lovely. And I always tell everybody on our tour bus, uh, make sure you got an empty bottle, because we, we bend down up there at the front where it's bubbling up, and we, we take our water in our bottles, and uh, it's pretty fun. And then I got another one here. Wentworth letter, <clears throat> the principal nation of the second race fell in battle towards the close of the fourth century. The remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. Joseph Smith is standing in Illinois. He's at Nauvoo. And he says the remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. Well, if it's a country, you've got borders. He's talking about the United States of America. It's just that simple. And I love Brigham Young. Brigham Young had this great story, and he was close to death, as I understand it, when this was recorded. And he wanted to make sure that everybody knew about the Hill Cumorah, that what was inside of it, that, that he had witnessed according to Oliver and Joseph and maybe some others. He said there, there was a large and spacious room that they laid the plates on the table. Under this table there was a pile of plates as much as two feet high. In this room, more plates probably than many wagon loads. The first time they went there, and through it, the first time they went there, I guess they went there more than once, right? The first time they went there, the sort of layman hung upon the wall, but when they went again, it had been taken down and laid upon the table across the gold plates. It was unsheathed, and on it was written these words, this sword will never be sheathed again until the kingdom of this world became the kingdom of our God and our Christ. So. I had to have some fun with this. I asked my Meso friends, uh, I do have a couple and they're still friends. I said, hey, if all this stuff is up in New York, how did it get from down there up here? And they said, well, the Lord, he just teleported the whole thing right up there. And I said, well, why didn't Moroni just hook a ride and go with him? Because <laughs> if I was Moroni, I would say, forget you, I'm not walking that distance. That's 3,800 miles. Carrying what, a 60 pound weight estimated? Not to mention that, you gotta go through maybe some hostile territory, gotta cross the Mexican desert? Forget it. So my friend Val Bagley, you've probably seen his cartoons in the church. Uh, he shows up every now and then in San Leona. So anyway, this is just this is a little poke, a little fun. I, I, I just love this, so take it in good humor. This is his cartoon. <laughs> There's no horses down there, so we got llamas. You can see the wagon. All the important stuff is on top, and of course you gotta go 3,787 3, miles to Camorra. There you go. Parley Pratt, bless his heart, I believe he put this together when he's on his mission over in England, and he says it all. He said, talking about Moroni, deposited them, the plates, carefully in the earth on a hill, which is then called Camorra, but it is situated in Ontario County, 
Township of Manchester, State of New York, North America. Is there anything there we don't understand about where the hill is? It's all there, partly. And of course, the big question is one hill or two. William Smith and Benjamin Winchester did the most damage. They get this started with RLDS members eventually, and they continued their work after uh, the, the demise of Nauvoo, and uh, especially Winchester. He did a lot of damage and getting the two hill st story started. So, but for the early saints, there was only one Camorra. There never was any two Camorras. They knew exactly where it was, and they supported it. Okay, number four. Artifactual evidence, Nephites, Hopewell, Jaredite, Adena, Civilization, North America. And I got to tell you, Heavenly Father's got a real strange sense of humor. This is my first artifact. I was baptized in July 1970, uh, my senior year, and I dabbled in antiques. I stripped furniture, sold antiques. I would bring them from the north of Wisconsin and I'd come down to the southern Wisconsin uh, where a little more affluence and I could get a good, good buck for them. And uh, that's what I did, did a lot of that. So when I got baptized, I knew that following Saturday there was a big, big auction and I didn't want to miss it. So I, I get baptized and I race home to get up there for the auction on Saturday morning. And uh, lo and behold, I got my best artifact for six bucks. You ready? I'm standing in the back. He's about 100 feet away. And I know the auctioneer. His name's Bunny Humple. And he knows I'm there for furniture. And of course, they're doing all the dishware and the kitchenware and all the stuff that I don't want. I'm hollering, Bunny, sell it all. Let's get the furniture. He holds up this box of books. And I'm telling you, my eyes just became like telescopic. I looked all the way to this box. And all of a sudden, I'm bidding on this box of books. And to, to Bunny's surprise, because this is what I saw. I thought, jeepers, looks like an old one. Maybe it's a first edition, you know, who knows, right? So I get this book for six bucks, <laughs> and uh, I later found out that uh, wherever the missions were established, they had permission to print their own Book of Mormons locally, so they'd, they'd keep them right there, you know, in the mission field, and they wouldn't have the shipping back and forth to Salt Lake. So. Uh, See, did I have that? Yeah, that uh, this is a 190. Yeah, this is 1907 edition of the Book of Mormon in Chicago. And uh, wait, you see this. <clears throat> and behold, this last whose branch had withered. See the red down at the bottom. Red circled as Nephites. Away, I did plant in a good spot of ground. Yellow. Look down below. America. Whoa. And thou beheld us that I also cut down that which cumbered the spot of ground green, Jaredites, 43. And thou beheld us that a part thereof, blue, Nephites, brought forth good fruit, and a part thereof brought forth wild fruit, brown, Lamanites. What do you think of that? Is that in our books today? No. And now I, Moroni, proceed to give an account of those ancient inhabitants who were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. North America. You guys seen this before? I didn't think so. The face of the earth, and their bones should become as heaps of earth upon the face of the land, except they should repent of their wickedness. The ancient mounds of North America. What do you think? Is that wild? I think that'll put it back in. <laughs> Waters of Ripley Ancom, supposed to be Lake Ontario. And the hill Rama, Rama was the hill Camorra. All right? This is my first artifact. Six bucks. Anybody want to buy it? <laughs> Not for sale. Eight bucks. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> parallels. Now, I mentioned parallels when I started, and I'm going to show you a little bit more what I mean here. Parallels in archaeology. Everything here, this is all supportive for the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> but again, you have to take it for what it is. This right here is a symbol of the Potawatomi's ancient ancestors in the state of Michigan. The Potawatomi will tell you, obviously, what this is, a menorah. 
The official record archaeology book says this is a fanciful pitchfork. <laughs> I have to live with these people out there. You know what I mean? it's, it's embarrassing. We have so many elephants. Don't let anybody tell you there's no elephants in North America. And Book of Mormon Timeline, if they, if, if they do, tell them to call me. Okay, I'm serious. There's elephants everywhere. Just everywhere. We, we got them carved on, on, on stone gorgets. The one in the bottom left corner, that's an effigy pipe, comes out of Iowa. We got petroglyphs of them, we got drawings of them, we got dirt effigy mounds. And the top right one, that's a Jaredite henge, which is a Dina. And inside there is a huge, what looks like a mastodon. I mean, this is nuts. How would a Jaredite, if all the elephants were gone, and he was here at 2000 BC, how would he be able to make a full outline of a mammoth if he only had the bones to look at? See, we got problems here, people. There's problems. And what's worse, you see the black gorget with the two holes? This one right here? Okay, if you look at that closely, the man that's standing in front of the elephant is holding a bow. A bow for bow and arrow. Well, if the elephant is alive and that man is a caveman, that means it's 10,000 BC. Or, if that is really a Hopewell Gorget, which only the Hopewell make this type of thing, so it's in the right timeline, it's in the right situ, that means this guy's trying to kill an elephant during Book of Mormon time. I mean, have you can't have it both ways. Have you ever figured out what Kiralons and Kumons are? Just some type, well, look, look at the elephant down the bottom corner. We've got the other two, they talk about, they got strange ears and, and different tusks and different kind of tail. That's all we know. That's all I can tell you. And then, imagine this, a guy gets shipwrecked, blown off course, he's so hungry for a steak, he starts drawing pictures of cows. <laughs> or maybe there were cows running around here, okay? Because that cow still is alive today, only we find it in the Mideast, all right? Cows. Talk about cows. Dr. Jones did a real good job. Him and two other professors went after the horse bones of the, of the, of the, uh, to date them, and they found out they had plenty of horse bones show up between 600 B.C. to 1481. Supposedly, the horses all died out at 10,000 B.C. That's, that's what's taught. And they're saying, no, 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 no. We got horse bones at 6,000 B.C. They made it through the Ice Age, and, of course, we got horses showing up with the Native Americans at 1481 A.D., which means the Spanish did not bring the horses here, okay? And, and, and Jones will stand on this. Now, Jones tried to put this report out through farms, and they refused to publish it. Otherwise, you guys would have had this about 1980, 81. But I got him to publish it in Ancient American, and there it is, okay? And this is a good one. Book of Mormon talks about migrating beasts. There are no migrating beasts south of the Rio Grande, only in North America. We have migrating beasts, and they happen to be buffalo. Buffalo, buffalo, love the buffalo. And check this guy out, too. Is this a bird of prey? Is this a falcon? Is this an eagle? Is this a hawk? Louder, please. Thank you. This is a parrot. I actually got a museum curator to take down the names falcon, hawk and a bird of prey off this artifact and put up the word parrot. I shamed him into it. In the Hopewell Mounds of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, they find bones of parrots and parakeets in large numbers. Hmm, what's a warm weather bird doing in the Midwest? It's because the Midwest had a different temperature during Book of Mormon timelines, and we can prove it. We can prove it because of our Vikings who were here at 900 A.D. Because between 11 and 1200 A.D., the Vikings were froze out of the North Country. That's when they had to go back to Norway. And that, you can go on the internet and you'll find it all. It's all there. It dropped an entire latitude. The castle building stopped in England at 12 to 1300 A.D. because they couldn't heat them. All the grapes were grown in, the best vineyards were in England. All the wine was made by monks. And because of that cold shift in the castles, they had to move to the north of France and the south and the north, excuse me, the south of France and the north of Italy. The monks just picked up and moved the vineyards right down there to that area to continue that tradition. 
It's all online. It's all online. Yes. Just going back to the mammoths, um, someone online was saying CBS Sports has a news with college football that they dug up in the end zone of Oregon State a mammoth bone, a bunch of mammoth bones dated to 10,000 year olds. Okay. Well, that's cool. Very good. Okay, so there's that there. And we have sheep. If we're going to have the law mose us and do proper sacrifice, we've got to have sheep. And we got sheep bones at Hopewell Settlements. We got sheep. Sheep. And here come the boats. And it came to pass, as timber was exceedingly scarce in the land northward, they did send forth much by way of shipping. Shipping. But behold, a hundredth part of the proceeding of this people, yea, the account of the Lamanites and of the Nephites and their shipping and their building of ships. Here's a survey done in the 1840s by Squire and Davis. This is Marietta, Ohio. I'm going to show you what's going on. That's the Hopewell structures that were put up. Notice how wide the rivers are and the creek. That's what it would look like in their day. In our day, I'm going to do the same thing. This is today. That's how big it is today. That's what's changed. It's gone down. That's their day, and this is our day. And what do we find in America? We find anchors. Lots of anchors. I could show you 50 anchors, almost one from every state. And you say, well, they don't look like much, Wayne. Well, guess what? Here's the Mediterranean anchors. They're the same. Are they not the same? Just a big old chunk of limestone. And look what the Indians give us. And this was done in 1819. The Book of Mormon hasn't even been published yet. Limestone quarries in Florida are believed to have provided anchors for ancient international sea trade. Well, who thought that up? John Johnson, Indian agent of the Shawnee, reported in Algonquin tradition. Algonquin tradition. They came to North America from across the Atlantic ocean and that white people using iron tools inhabited Florida. <coughs> I can give you an Indian tra oral tradition just about everything in North America people but we don't listen to these guys. That's my point. We don't listen to them. We ignore them. But I'm thinking about this, Florida iron tools coming across by boat. Helaman, right? Mula comes into land north, Lehi comes into land south. The oldest area for Hopewell in all of North America is the state of Florida. The yellow is the oldest and the red is right behind it, so we don't know where they landed exactly. But these are two sites that I have marked out. The one in yellow is Crystal River. It's the best. It's all Hopewell. The mounds are there. The artifacts are there. The pottery is there. And they're sitting at 31.7 degrees latitude. And I looked at this for a long time. I had this for a couple of years. And finally, the lights go on. The spirit probably, you know, kicked me in the butt. I said, Wayne, go check out the latitude for Jerusalem. Oh, okay. Oh, gee, it's the same. Well, why is that important? Because when they arrived, it said they put all their seeds in the ground and they took root. They had to land in a comparable territory. That's my point means they had to come in the spring of the year, which means they had to leave over there in the fall of the year to make their journey across the Atlantic. Had to leave in the fall, arrive here in the spring, and they could plant their seeds. And we got concrete. A lot of big Hopa mounds have concrete floors. They got concrete caps over the top. And for you ladies, boy, these Hopewell gals love their pearls. This is only two mounds, 48,000 in one and 100,000 in the other. Freshwater pearls. Freshwater. But what I like is on the bottom, they had holes drilled through them and they were sewn onto cloth, not buckskin. The Hopewell people wore cloth. Go to the museum in Columbus, Ohio, and you can see samples of the cloth of the Hopewell. And it has colors in it. Yes? So it was clothing. Clothing. And so it was like, you like this? Or you, you couldn't see a whole outfit, it's just pieces. All we've got is pieces. So I can't even tell you, you know, that way. Battle mounds. If war's over, they throw them into a big pile, throw a shallow covering earth. We've got these all over America, in the West, in the Midwest. These are called battle mounds. You take them apart, this is what you find. 
men, women, and children, and they usually got a hole in the head of the skull, hit with an ax, quick death. And people say, well, where's all the swords? We got swords. I got swords. How many swords do you want to see? And we have cemeteries. Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Ohio. Now, iron swords are rare. In the books, when a guy is dug up, they'll find a handle at his hip, and they'll find a big, long line of red rust all the way down to his knee, and then a little tip from the scabbard made out of bone. The iron has gone back to the earth. Very difficult to find an iron sword. And look at this guy. This guy was taking a walk on the beach. A tip of this was sticking up. He just reached down and pulled it right out of the sand. And so, to be a good guy, he goes to the, he's on the Canadian side of Lake Superior. He goes to the uh, Toronto Museum, Canada, and he presents this artifact to them and said, here, add this to your collection and uh, show it off. I'll give it to you free, no strings. Guess what the curator said? No, no thank you. <laughs> Why is that? Indians don't make swords. This has to be a fake. Somebody did this for whatever, and that's the way it goes, okay? Head plates, breastplates. Here's a breastplate. This is how they work. Notice the large hole right here. Imagine a knotted leather cord. You pull that knot through the hole, and then you cinch. Pull it through the hole, cinch. All four sides, the two in the neck then are a stabilizer to keep it stable. And some of them, we even have a, a one for the middle and one for the bottom, cover the whole abdomen of the person wearing it. And, and they, they're scaled down, much like a, a shrimp or a lobster. Same, same idea, scaled down to fit, right down there, your vitals to keep them protected. Here's a head plate, it's all copper, big ear shields. These had leather and cloth caps attached to them. Uh, probably like a, uh, you look at a football helmet from like 1910, you're probably looking at a head plate. <laughs> you know, a good, a good idea. And these here, this is a shoulder plate and a, a, a uh, guard up on top. If you could see that better, it's not a great picture, but there's little teeny holes about every inch all the way around the big one. that would be sewn onto a garment. Put it on like a jacket, okay? It's on, it's sewn on, attached. And then this here, my friend Danny Lawson found this in a creek at Nauvoo, Illinois. We don't know if it's an arm shield, but boy, it sure could be one. And I got two in from the museum there to, you can see in the bottom corner. How thick was the leather pieces? Oh, I, I don't know. They didn't record in their work. But they could tell the leather and the cloth, when they'd find these things, it would literally just dis disintegrate within seconds in the air. I mean, it, there's no way to preserve it. They, they couldn't. So, Moroni. Ditches, banks of earth, wood palisades, place of entrance. Again, here's all that area they covered. Again, here's the three types. Here's a typical wall. This is Fort Ancient. This one is 24 feet today. Archaeologists figure it was probably 30 foot. And then you put a wooden palisade on top of that. Here's an example of a ditch. And here's another ditch. I'm inside. Now you can begin to appreciate the scale of these things. They're very, very large. Alma 50, two through four. Upon the top of these ridges of earth, he caused there should be timbers built to the height of a man. And built upon those timbers, he caused towers to be erected. Here's a drawing. We know that they also put up some kind of a, a very organic plaster uh, on the wood uh, to retard rot, no doubt, and probably fire. And then uh, in the bottom, archeologists, when they found the post molds, the holes in the ground, they reconstructed an actual wall of a fort with the towers, and that's what it looks like. And this one is really good. A uh, house cluster in Fort Ancient, look at the dates. 390 BC, they've got continuous occupation at Fort Ancient all the way down to 380 AD, just about the whole Book of Mormon timeline. I mean, that's just terrific. Great stuff, great stuff. And the guy that did the work on a lot of this is uh, Riordan. He's, he's really a good guy. He now is one of the few guys saying, hey, all these uh, uh, hill forts are definitely uh, forts. They're not sacred centers. And this one here, he, he went and worked on the Pollock earthworks. And he, he, when he got done, he found that the enclosure itself was circular, built upon a stockade of burned, sturdy logs. 
This is early evidence of Hopewell earthworks used as a defensive enclosure. I'm going to take you here, and uh, by the way, um, the only way you can get here is if you call me, because no one knows where this is. Isn't that nice? So if you want to see it, you have to go on a tour with me. Anyway, here's the Pollock earthworks. It has never been leveled or farmed. It's still in its pristine condition just from its natural weathering. And I'm on top of one of the walls. That's the actual berms. This is an entrance coming in. And there's the height. Now I'm going to take Photoshop and I'm going to drop a wooden log wall on the top and I'm going to put a tower on each side of the entrance. Okay? Photoshop. There you go. They also had limestone laid in front of all the doorways, the entrances, uh, obviously because of mud. It's very wet in the Midwest, so you want to be able to walk in and not have all that slop going on uh, for yourself or whatever. The only thing here that's a complete guess is the door. I do not know what the doors look like. But the, the walls and the towers are based on the, the shape of the post molds at the site, and then they would take limestone slabs and lay up against the earth underneath the wall, again, to retard uh, the digging down by the Lamanites. This is a real good one. Again, this is really a big support for Book of Mormon. Captain Moroni here, he had been fortifying all these cities, and uh, you read this over and over again, in the borders of your lands lay all around about the land, and it says, for every city in all the land round about. Now, if you think of what I showed you in the map with all the red dots, you're going to go around and you're going to cut trees and you're going to line every one of the walls, okay? Then you're going to build towers, right? And then, when you're done, you can't leave the trees in front of the fort, right? That gives your enemy, he can cover and get right up to the wall. We can't have that. So the trees down in front of the fort now, they got to go. So they got to be gone, okay? Now, what are you going to do with all this brush? What are you going to do? You're going to burn it. Absolutely. Let's burn it. And they left us a record. Scientists of the Midwest, a stalagmite found in West Virginia cave showed a major change in the carbon record about 100 B.C. A new study led by Ohio scientists suggests that early Native Americans left a bigger carbon footprint than previously thought, providing more evidence than the humans impact the global climate long before modern industrial area. They would go through here, and would, you do layers because it's dripping down, and that carbon layer bounces off the top, and it gets covered over, and that's how they can do that. It's the same principle as going to the North and South Pole and core drilling deep into the frost and the frozen tundra. Pulling up, and they can tell what the snowfall was like, how much pollen was in the air, and all that good stuff. And here, they can tell the carbon. There was a lot of smoke in there, 100 B.C., the forts were started being built at 72 BC. That's close enough in my book. I'll take it for Book of Mormon support. And then, just for heck, I was cruising through Iowa, and guess who I found? I found Alma and Alma the Younger. Would you like to see them? <laughs> there they are. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, number five. Potential site of Zarahemla as evidenced by the scripture and the archaeology. I have used this for my guide. I take this literally, that across from Nauvoo Temple, according to DC 125 and 3, that uh, I believe that's where Zarahemla stood. And that's where we're working. We're doing a lot of work there. And uh, this is a, a nice uh, color rendition of it. The locals call this the bean. The red stars, uh, the one on, on the, the right side there, that's uh, obviously Nauvoo. And on the bean side, that's our Zarahemla temple site that, that we're working. Here it is from Google Earth. Looking down on it, here's a little closer. See the little rectangle sitting down in there? That's what got my attention. And uh, I went over there and I did some sleuthing. And as I came around this corner, follow the arrows, and that orange rectangle, that's where it's going to end up being. But as I walked through there, and I'm looking straight across, this was my very first view, December 19, 2010, looking across at the temple. And the one to the left is the Catholic Church. That's what it looks like, looking across. And I got a little better, clearer shot here. There's the temple. And I want to point it out to you right there. And then I got to do an aerial with Dean C. Jessions, and uh, gave us this beautiful aerial. It goes straight across to our temple site. Here again is another shot looking down. 
Now, technically, where the trees are on the north, that is part of the temple lot, but I couldn't acquire that. It wasn't for sale. I, I just, we, we bought this. I, I raised the money out here with about nine good Latter-day Saints, and uh, we bought the lot. We own it privately, so it's safe. Uh, no one can do anything to it. But we are on there now working uh, whenever we can. We have to raise our money because we're all private in what we do. And so I sent this uh, question to my friend Mark Harvey, and he went into the church history department, and I told him to ask about this thing, 125 and 3. And here's the answer he got back from Tyson Thorpe, church history librarian. Now, as for your question, there are instances where a planned temple for Zarahemla, Iowa, was mentioned. But we have no record of an actual site ever being picked and no maps that show a site. I asked members of the Joseph Smith Papers to see if there was something they had discovered while working on the project. But there is no known record of a temple site ever being picked or dedicated in that area of Iowa. I have attached a brief example of some brethren discussing the possibility of a temple. It comes from the biological, biographical sketches of Edward Phillips, manuscript 11215. I have underlined the section where he makes a brief mention of a temple being built in Zarahemla. And here it is. Now this is Phillips talking. This is in his diary. I was standing by the temple talking to Brother Woodruff. He pointed out a spot to me on the opposite side of the river about a mile and a half above Montrose, and he said there would be a city and a temple built there, and the place would be called Zarahemla. So I pulled out a little cheap map, took a picture of it, and sure enough, it's a mile and a half above Montrose is exactly where we are. So in 2013, we purchased the site, and my first uh, shot here was a resistivity, and this shows that we definitely had a target of some nature. Um, the guy who did it thought these might be doorways, and once I looked at it, I said, no, those aren't doors. Those are the ramps that showed up. And then we did a, an excavation. And our big hope was, because Zarahemla had been burned, we were hoping that maybe all the burned timbers had been just you know, pressed down on the ground, covered over, and then a new one, a new platform put up with the building. And then we'd have plenty of stuff to carbon date. We found out that that was not the case. I now know that what they did, they cleaned out the entire rectangle down to about 21 feet, and they filled it with the sand that you see in front of these helpers here, right here. And Yutana was here, back here. Yutana was working on the site with us. The sand covers that rectangular area only. And uh, I want to circle this guy. <clears throat> He's from the RALDS community, and he came up and helped us. I had invited several to come up from Missouri, and Adam, his name is Adam, he came up. And uh, we're trying to build bridges uh, between so that Salt Lake LDS, our LDS feel more comfortable around each other. And this is our archaeologist on site that was uh, conducting everything. Here's what one of our digs looked like. The problem was the sand was so fine, uh, we couldn't go down any deeper than about uh, nine feet because it, it would cave in, so it was dangerous. It was just in a way, and we didn't have the money to build a coffer that would allow us to go down with, with protected sides. But then what I did was, <clears throat> if you see up here where the red line is, okay, where it says number two, that's inside the temple square. That's the light sand. The minute you step out, then you get the normal layers of, of black and brown and all that stuff. That's the dirt. And so then I, to check it out, I went up to midfield and I went to the west end with a, with, a, with a backhoe and we just took a couple of scoops out and sure enough, the soil all remained the same. The square rectangular area has been dug out at 21 feet, filled with this white, white sand. On top of that would have been the platform, which is right here with the ramps, and then a wooden building would have been built on top of that. And that's been all taken away. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I was disappointed at first. But then I realized, probably sometime later, several weeks, that when the Nauvoo Temple was built, they did not take the remaining stones of the Nauvoo Temple and push them all into the depression, cover it with dirt, and build a new temple on top of the old temple. Everything was removed. And they went out north of town, and they deposited a farmer's field, dug a big hole, and buried all the temple stone. So these guys did the same thing, purified the site, purified the foundation, purified the location. And so with that in mind, that made me feel a lot better, and I, I thought it was awesome. So then I brought in my, my friend, uh, Dr. Shares, uh, University of Wisconsin. He's a surveyor. We surveyed the entire property, and what was good about that, in that back left southwest corner, we found this huge, huge tree. 
And I, I hired uh, a professional tree cutter. They came in, they cut the thing down, and right up until the center, right at the very center, we got about a volleyball size that's absolutely gone to rot. We can't get a date off it. But up to that point, we got the tree at 1706 on tree rings. That's called dendrochronology, and that's acceptable for dating in archaeology. And with that other, is easily another 100 years, easily. And this thing is, by the way, by the way is five feet across on, on the diameter inside, all the way across, a huge, huge black cherry, and it was still alive. So when we cut this through, we saw that rot, which is unfortunate, but we now know this thing was standing here at least 1600 AD. And why that's important is because it's on the berm, which shows the berm was here, the wall that goes around the rectangular block. You follow? It's on top of the berm. That's why it was so important to do that. And then Dr. Shares, he's standing at Station 1. You see Station 1 up there? He's looking straight across. He does what's called a sunshot. He looks across there, and he looks back at me, and he says, Wayne, he said, what's over there underneath your, your Mormon church? You know, Mormon church. And I said, well, I have no idea, unless someone has a, a diary or a journal and something were to come up, I can't tell you. He said, well, he said, what's going to happen on the equinox? The sun's going to rise, and it's going to rise right behind your Mormon church. And he said, that light is going to shine right here. And he said, that doesn't happen by accident. So he says, you really got something here. Something's going on. And I said, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So a few years later, I'm down in the spring equinox. Got to see what's going on. Looking across at the Nauvoo Temple, um, notice there's a bump on that right side. Well, that's the water tower from downtown. And it just happens to be in the way. I wish it wasn't there. But anyway, it you know, looks like you guy's got a, you know, a sore tooth, you know, jaw. It's just all swollen. But anyway, a big bump sticking out there. And uh, so we're waiting, and uh, we got to go. Uh, we started on a, a Saturday, no, the Sunday, excuse me, because we knew that on Monday, that's right, on Monday uh, it was forecast to be totally overcovered and rain, which means we couldn't see sunrise. That was the day, Monday for sure or Tuesday. So on Sunday, on the 19th, this is our morning shot. We're waiting for sunrise. And while we're there, I just turned and looked up at the moon. And if you look at the moon, it's not quite half gone. You see, it's not ready yet. Because when, when the day hits, that thing has to be perfect line top to bottom okay there's little balls yet there on the back side so we know we're not there but we wanted to shoot because we're forecasting rain so here we are we're watching it the sun now is up in the east we can't see it yet and then all of a sudden bang it pops up and look here just <laughs> just minutes and of course it gives the effect that the sun is just screaming through the sky it's really cool to see of course it's the earth turning obviously but uh it was really fascinating to watch that, but we realized, okay, we've got to find another way to do this. So we came back, and two years later, in 17, and we had a new plan. And the plan was we had to get somebody either in the Catholic Church spent tower, or we had to get on top of the water tower. We had to be able to see all the way to the east horizon. Well, the Catholics weren't cooperative, and we didn't even bother to ask the city fathers for the Nauvoo Tower. <laughs> So uh, we went and paid a visit to our temple president, and we got in. I sent two guys, and they had to wear their whites. They sat up in that tower and waited. So there's your Catholic steeple, <clears throat> there's your water tower, and there's our temple. So here we are. We're on the morning. It's almost there, and you can see the flash down at the bottom. They got their, their camera on automatic so that she's just, you know, boom, 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 boom. It's going because when it happens, it comes quick. And right there, bango. Right, 654, 656, we got full sunrise, screaming. Look at the flash down at the bottom. I'm going to draw a line from that flash all the way through to the moon. I mean, excuse me, the sun. And look at the distance. See what happens to the water tower? There's that bulge sticking out. Remember? Off to the right, there's that bulge. And then, of course, that's the line of uh, rise that the, the sun's going to follow. It goes pretty quick. Now, on my side, this is what I see. I don't see the sun until it breaks off just to the right of the temple because uh, they're already looking at it, and we got it at 704 on that side screaming. So then I had to run up and down the Iowa on Mississippi to make sure the Hopewell were there in big numbers, and I wasn't disappointed. I got fish farms at 200 B.C., Turkey River 500 B.C., Catfish Creek at 500 B.C., Toolsboro 200, and Malchow at 400 B.C. By the way, all these dates are not Nephite. 
These are mulekites. Nephites aren't here yet. Okay, these are all mulekite sites. So the Hopewell are here. They're definitely here. So I was very happy about that. So then we decided we're going to do some neat scanning. We had to go get a super, super expensive machine that we rented from Germany. And we got permission. I spent uh, uh, two weeks down there going farm to farm. And I got permission on 11,000 acres that we had permission to go on. We only did about 300. Uh, but number one, that is the temple site. And then we worked our way toward Montrose. Montrose is higher ground, and because of that, we knew that would be favorable for the city. So we, we went that direction, and we did a lot around Montrose as close as we could. Uh, this is what the gadget looks like. It goes 10 miles an hour, shoots down about 20 feet, and we're picking up fire pits because we can date charcoal. That's all we're after, fire pits, fire pits. And we picked up thousands of fire pits. Don't know the dates. So here's what it looks like. This is our finished... Uh, information we got all kinds of targets this is just one spot and so what we're going to do now we're going to come back and we have to come back and we're going to take hand cores we're going to dig a hole and we're going to hand core to go look at the fire pits now what we found out which is really we figured is a blessing the state of iowa is the only state in the united states we talk about the cloud for our computers right we all with us the cloud iowa has their own grid system over their entire state so what happens is we get a thing called a Grover, which Mike here is in his hand. Here's another picture of the Grover. Okay. He then sets up, this is a station. We're locked into the station. Now, when we go out into the field and we identify the points that the scanner has shot, this Grover identifies that spot in the ground to the spot up in the sky. So we can go away for a couple of years and come back with that Grover, and it'll put us within three inches of that spot out in the field. Nobody else in America has this except Iowa. And that's exactly where we need to be. So we just felt really blessed. Unfortunately, I had to have, we had to have about 20, 22 inches of dirt removed before we got the core. That was my job. And I found out I had some muscles I hadn't used in a long time. <laughs> but anyway, it was all worth it. It was pretty cold that day. I got my big uh, uh, park on. But anyway, it all worked out. It got warmer. And as it did, we could shed our coats. And here we are. Mike and Brian are doing the coring. We only went down about 40 inches. That's about all the further we could go with our core. 40 inches. 40 inches. Doesn't sound like much, but I gotta tell you guys, it's pretty tough coring. But we got stuff, we got iron, and we got lots of charcoal. Now, we don't know where we are, but we got stuff, okay? So, come back our tests, we, we were, not disappointed, but we were surprised. The majority of our work fell out in about 1,000 to 1,100 AD at the 40-inch level. However, we did run into one fire pit that came out to be about two, uh, uh, 235 or 225 BC clamshell. So the Mulekites were eating clams that night for supper, which was certainly cool. And uh, so now we learned we've got to go at least 50, 55 inches to hit Nephite turf, Mulekite. And we'll be doing that this November. We've already raised the money to do that. And uh, we'll be going back with it now. We'll have a mechanical core machine to go down that depth. We can't do it by hand. It's too difficult. Then, <clears throat> here's a radio, yeah, 225 BC. And uh, <clears throat> we know we gotta go deeper. Here's the actual clamshell. I also picked up from two local pot hunters. These are surface finds. Shod, shards on the surface. And uh, there's the dates. And the last one was undeterminable. <clears throat> but the good news is we did also find black sand pottery. Black sand pottery is only made by Hopewell. So we were really excited. So we send this guy in, <laughs> this black sand pottery, and we talked to the archaeologists here. And it, first of all, it came back in the test about 1,000 A.D. And we were like, what the heck? Now, we know black sand is made by Hopewell. What is going on? We, Mike got a hold of the state archaeologist for Ohio, excuse me, Iowa, <clears throat> and he said that uh, black sand pottery began in Lee County, Iowa, about 350 to 100 B.C., ending, ending, there's that 400 A.D. date, okay? This type of pottery spread eastward 
across the heartland of America during this timeline. Black sand pottery is Hopewell. And then, of course, we called him back and we told him what would happen to us. And he said, well, you've experienced uh, something that's not unusual. He said, what happened was, a thousand, at 1000 AD, somebody picked up your pottery, maybe it was still intact, and they used it. And when they got done with it, they threw it into their fire at 1000 AD. Thermal luminescence that we're using for our testing is based upon heat. <coughs> what happened was, when he put your pottery, Hopewell, into the fire at 1000 AD, it reset the time clock. He said, you got Hopewell pottery. You just can't give the date because the guy put it into the fire. So we were okay. So now we know. We're going to go deeper. That's where we are. So there we are, black sand in our clamshell. So we got Mulekites and we got Hopewell. We will be cutting a trench, a small one, this summer. And uh, we're going to be doing some, uh, just some small grabs. And then here's my final explanations. Hopewell comments and views. Again, I want to cover this here about my aha moment. It was a major deal today to talk about uh, Joseph and uh, all, making all these neat statements on the Hopewell. Uh, I, I really feel unfortunate. Again, Oliver Cowdery's letter seven, identifying Camorra in New York State. Pratt comes along. There is no question that Pratt knew Camorra in Palmyra was the hill. Our first mission again goes to who? The Indians of the Ohio, not to the Maya people of Central America. Did Joseph make a mistake? I don't think so. And again, I, I can't say enough about Professor Mills figuring this out with dirt archaeology. The war breaks out at 322, and he follows it all the way across right here. And it's all over at 385. And then Moroni says farewell at 421 AD. And uh, dirt archaeology, and the guy nailed it. I mean, he just nailed it. And of course, this here also is one of my favorites. This guy here, Arthur Parker, he's half Seneca. And he became an archaeologist. He goes into western New York. He says, oh my gosh. He said, in western New York, we have more Hopewell artifacts than we do in Ohio. Now think about it. How is that possible? They're in Ohio for a long time, but yet they're in New York only a short time. Well, the reason that was there, which he doesn't understand, is because we got the glue. We got the Book of Mormon. When they left Zarahemla, and they're gathering everybody into the land of Nephi. They're gathering us all the lands they had to pass through, land bountiful. When they got to western New York, the old cliche, we took everything but the kitchen sink. These people knew they weren't going back to Zarahemla. So they brought everything they could possibly carry to carry on life and make a stand in the land of many waters in western New York. And that's what they did. And that's why the artifacts are there. And he says the Iroquois, the waves of Iroquois moved in right on top of them. And that's the destruction period. And I've got this all laid out in a DVD in the back if you're interested. Now, I also like to point this out. The promised land, as I understand it, as a member of the church, the Garden of Eden has to be there. Adam lived there. Noah lived there. Adam on the Amma is there. And Enoch lived there. As I read my Book of Mormon, it's going to be a nation of Gentiles, a land of liberty, a land to be a free nation, the land of the new Jerusalem. No kings are allowed in the land. Nations of the world are going to flow into it, and it will be protected against all other nations. Now, if you guys have, still don't have any idea where the promised land is, I'm going to give you one more message, and after this, I can't help you. All right? This is it. <laughs> I'm a one hill guy, I report, and you decide. Now, before we quit, one more thing. Trace, Trace come on up. <clears throat> the majority of what's on this presentation, if you want it, it's on this DVD. This is a three, almost three and a half hours. It's a double disc. It sells for $30. However, I'm offering it tonight at half price at 15 And if you want more to take home to family and friends, you buy the first one at 15 you can have everything thereafter at $10. And all the other DVDs up there are at $10 each. So this is the time to bulk up because everything's half off. And with that, I will stop. Trace. Thank you, thank you. Let's all get up. Can I ask you to answer one question in one minute or less? 
because I'm sure you can ask a zillion questions, but there's some of us who served missions in Central America or South America, and we've had all kinds of interesting uh, feelings about or statements about the land of the Lehigh being down there. Can you just give a one minute or less take on that issue as you perceive it? When Christ uh, came here and at the end when he was, his time was finished with the Nephites, he told them, he said, when I was in Jerusalem, I told those people in Jerusalem, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. And, and that was you. And now I'm here and I've got to leave and I'm telling you, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And so Christ went down there, I have no doubt. He went from probably the tip of Alaska all the way to the tip of Argentina and then out to the islands. Now, years ago, I was giving a talk and it was down in uh, Arizona country. I had several Latino people. And when I finished, 10 or 12 people came up to talk, which is normal. But I had three Latino girls come over here and I could see they were crying. They had been crying. And when we got done, I, I got to the gals, I said, okay, what, what's the deal? And they said, Brother May, he said, we have, we have felt the spirit of the Lord tonight. The problem is we now know we are not children of Lehi. Who are we? And I said, dear sisters, you're Gentiles just like I am, and you're supposed to be in the church. Oh, thank the Lord. Everything's fine. <laughs> okay, so. thank you. Self? <laughs> oh, yeah, they don't know that. Can you take 30 seconds? He's going to deal with Zelf. You know who Zelf was, right? <clears throat> Tell him what you're going to do this time. Okay, we, we tracked it down. Uh, the uh, memorial, uh, it's outside of Liberty, Missouri, and uh, it's where the, uh, Joseph and Hiram met and ended the, Zelf, the Zion's Camp March. And somewhere on that property, they buried the bones of Zelf that they brought from Illinois because they intended to put them on the temple lot, but Everything was bad there. They couldn't go into Independence because they, they would have gone to a fight or even killed. So uh, I got permission from the association to take my GPR, which I have a good one, and we're going to scan it and uh, look for anything on it. We're, we're expecting no more than three to four feet. They, I don't think they would have dug down for, you know, we're hoping it's in a box, and we're hoping they wrapped it to keep it uh, good. But we're going to look for Zelf's bones, and uh, we got permission to dig them up. And if we do, we're praying we can go after DNA. Yes, sir. Question. I heard, I think it was Joseph Smith that once, I think at Adam on Diom or somewhere, there was a pile of old, old stones. Yes. And he mentioned that that was an altar that I think Adam had built or something that effect. That is correct. Where that's located? Yes, I do. And, and uh, are there, there there's two. There's, there's two. There's the there's the altar of sacrifice and there's the, there's the the altar of of, of uh, altar of prayer, that's the two names prayer and sacrifice. Now let me tell you the funny though, my wife and I went there a year after we got married and we were there in '71. Uh, we drove up to the field, and uh, at that time uh, the place wasn't like it is today. There was a, a wire fence with a hoop over it. You open that and you, you drive through and you close it back because there's cows out there. And the farmer owns the land, and he gave the church easement to drive through. And you drive it to the base of the hill, below the, the altar of prayer, and there's a big sign just stuck in the ground So this is where Adam dwelt. I mean, that was it, okay? So uh, we went up on top and walked around a little bit, and we came back down. And we came back, and as we were going out the gate, the farmer showed up. And he said, uh, he said you know, how was it? I said, well, it was nice. We just went up and looked at it, and, you know, Beautiful, beautiful view out to the, the Grand River. And he said, well, did you take a stone? I said, stone? I, I don't know what you mean. He said, well, there's a stone pile up there. Did you take a stone? I said, uh, no, I didn't take a stone. He said, well, okay, that's fine. But he says, I pick my fields all every year here, and I pile stones up there by your altar prayer. And <laughs> you, you, you Mormons show up, and you guys haul my stones off by <laughs> the end of the year. And I said, well, I guess I didn't fall for that one. But uh, anyway, he, he thought, oh, darn, you know, there's a couple left. So he still puts them up there, but not anymore today because now the church owns all that stuff. So, but uh, I thought it was pretty awesome. That's you know, we were young. We didn't know what was going on. So I'm sure many of you will have questions. Feel free to come up here. Books, yeah. him, yeah. dessert. You can hang around as long as you want. Sorry, this is a little long, but we hope you still like having come. Thank you.
Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate what you've done. So, Wayne, did you ever find where the altar of the Adam? I know where it is. Yeah. I imagine that's probably kept secret. It's, it's not down where you walk. You, you, you got to go up higher. And, and are there any stones left? I mean, Joseph Smith's dad. There's stones there, but they're under the sod. There's a foundation under the sod of stone. It may, yeah, it make, makes a nice big rectangle. Yeah, you, you can stick a steel post through there and tap on the stones. So, uh, did you ever see any chariots when you were... I have two stones with chariots on them carved. Oh, really? Yeah. Because when they had the Mayan exhibit here at the University of Utah, I went all through that whole exhibit to see if I could find any, you know, drawings, or mm -hmm. carvings, and I couldn't find anything with a wheel in it or anything with a chariot in it. And uh, if you, I've been to Israel and Egypt and all of your release of these chariots. Yep. I have two two stones with, with chariots on them. One from Michigan and one from Illinois. So if you'd like a photograph, just contact me through email or something. Uh, get, it, get it from Trace. He'll give you my email and all my contact. Just drop in, tell me what you want. Okay? Where do like the, the Western Indian tribe, like the you like the, these out here, where do, where okay. do they fall in this? The Hopi are connected some way, somehow. Navajo. They showed up around 1200 A.D. Oh, they're that way. They are not Lamanite. They're, they're Mongols, Mongolonians. So they have come from the, on the west coast. Uh, that is correct. And of course, the whole Eskimo, Athabascans, they're all, it's all coming over from China. Okay. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Okay. And the Aztecs, 1100 A.D., they're youngsters. They're the not Aztecs that old. Are, they're 1100 A.D. Oh, is when they showed up. I just the a, yeah. a couple months ago. That's, that's good. Good information. Thank you. Uh, I'm not even sure I have a question.